Welcome to the Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show, your guide, of course, as you know by now, to better cricket. Whoever you are, wherever you are, we're here to help you out for the next uh, half an hour or so. My name is David Hinchliffe and I look after things. And helping me to help you are two very fine cricket coaches. The first is the Director of Cricket at Millfield School. It's Mark Garraway. Hello, Garris. How are you? Very well. Sunny day. A uh, bit crisp, but I love it like that. Um, yes, I'm very happy. No car parks today. It was a car park last week. No car parks today, mate. I'm uh, very much looking at trees at the moment and oh, cricket better. grounds and vistas. Yeah, lovely. That's what we want. Secondly, it's the cricket professional at Portsmouth Grammar School. It's Sam Lavery. Hello, Lavers. How's it going? Very well, thank you, David. Very well. Drama free over here. Um, technology smooth. Skype, Skype efficient as ever. Everything, everything just how it should be. No, don't worry, none of this, none of this will ever go out on the air. <laughs> I wanted to um, chat this week about um, a word that's been on my mind recently, and, it, and it's uh, the word that is standards. Because you hear it banded around a lot. It's one of those things that has been around as long as uh, I guess sport has been around. Really, you know what? What standards do we want to set? What discipline do we want to have as a team? Um, lots of questions around that word standards. So I wanted to get your guys' opinion on it, really. what For you, what is important when it comes to having standards, setting standards in a, in a cricketing environment? I think it's, to me, it's about repeatable disciplines and, and getting some good practice. So an example of repeatable discipline that we would suggest uh, it, it equates to good standards would be turning up on time, getting on with your warm-up, for the warm-up to be an effective one where you know what you're doing, that you can just deliver it off pat and it prepares you for um, the performance in a net or in a fielding session or in a game uh, that you've got ahead of you. So that would be an example of uh, some good standards being delivered by by a team that I'm working with and, and hopefully for that to be a fairly self-reliant process rather than uh, always being chipped on to make that happen. So Gareth, how about when things don't quite go according to plan? Um, what happens when standards are below what you would like them to be? How do you deal with that? The first thing I do is, is try and work out where the gap in understanding is, uh, or, or in fact, if it is understanding, if it's just laziness or tiredness on the behalf of everybody else. So rather than getting too, too uh, intentful with my questions to start off with, I, I'd ask them, you know, what is it that's stopping us from, from getting on and doing things uh, really well? Is it the fact that they haven't got enough information if they haven't been shown it? initially they don't know quite what they're doing or or is it because of you know they're not motivated to do it so i get to a root cause really a lot of the time i have to say is it's down to people not 100 percent understanding what what they're meant to be doing and that often falls back onto my shoulders or our coaching team's shoulders because you can't expect anybody to hit those standards if you haven't taken them through that right education process and made them familiar with it so uh, more more often than not it comes down to the fact that somebody or a group of players aren't quite 100 percent sure on what they're meant to be doing and then that comes down to us to reiterate that or to to show them in a different way to get that understanding across and Labors, what would you how would you define the word standards in in the teams that you coach um well it, it's an interesting subject here and it's a, it's a word that's used a lot isn't it and, and yeah. I, I suppose that some people as with a lot of terms that are used every day people probably have slightly different perception of what it does mean um with us it would be i I would i would think about it it kind of concerning some core elements that we all have an understanding of um i think gareth has talked a little bit about about there of um players having an awareness of what they're actually what is expected of them then them understanding it and having that level of understanding and i think that is vital to um, meeting any standard is having the understanding. We, we'd usually try and have a, a basic expectation across um, some pretty simple things that we do. Um, there'll be standards of behaviour, standards of um, work rate, um, standards of some some simple um, skill based things, but um, probably the standards that we have are, are more the standards of. Um, uh, kind of work rate, effort, um, 
and, and commitment to what we're trying to do. Um, not necessarily all of those are easy to measure and sometimes that's where we get those grey areas where um, deciding whether or not someone's meeting a certain standard is, is sometimes quite tricky. Um, but uh, we, would, we would definitely kind of talk about them as a group and, and make sure that it's something that the group is aware of. Probably the group have some input into what good standards are in, in certain aspects and, and obviously the coaching team would would probably lead on a couple of other areas where they have their own expectations but again like strong communication to make sure everyone's aware of what they're supposed to be achieving is, is going to be the, the most important starting point. Yeah, it is, it is a bit of a catch-all word, isn't it, that can mean different things to different people. And you can talk about, if you're talking about uh, younger players, you might be talking about standards of behaviour and that might be led much more by a coach than, than by the team. And you're talking about older players, you might be talking about different types of standards and, and different ways of, of coming up with them. And then you get different problems from that, you know more senior teams, it tends to be more of a conflict between guy, the majority who want a certain standard and those sort of guys who are outliers and, and are not interested in that as a standard. And then with younger guys, it's it, it's more around sort of um, behaviour standards, I suppose, is where the problems can, can flare up. So there are different types of standards and then different types of problems you can get off the back of them, right? Yeah, you got your performance ones, haven't you? I think if you get to a point where you're concerned mostly about your performance standards, then you've got the cultural stuff nailed, haven't you? You know, you've got the people turning up and doing their their stuff their stuff on a regular basis. Basis absolutely nailed. Whereas if we, you know, um, and if we get to that point, there we're, we're laughing really, and then we can start to focus on, yeah, we want our point fielder to be able to hit the bowler's end stumps, you know, six out of ten, three set, three stumps, six out of ten. That's a lovely place to be, I think. But most of the time, as coaches, when you're working with teams, I think uh, we're operating more around the behavioural, not because people are behaving badly, but just trying to get the team to operate at a level where hopefully you can move into uh, performance type stuff on a more regular basis. Okay, let's um, open up the mailbag this week, the virtual mailbag, and dip inside and, and see what we've got. A couple of questions that have been sent in by listeners to the show. They want some help with their cricket, and that's what we're here to do. But we also will give a prize to the best question of the week, which is an online coaching course from Pitch Vision Academy at pitchvision.com. And uh, if you want to send your questions into us for future shows, you can do that by emailing coach at pitchvision.com or getting us through social media, which we'll tell you about towards the end of the show. And that is what uh, Suman has done. He's got in touch with us. And uh, Suman has also sent us a couple of pictures in as well, which I've sent to you guys. Um, and his question is, I am 16 and playing district level cricket. On off day practice, whenever I practice in nets, sometimes I record my batting to see what's going wrong. And every time I notice some problems that I've noticed in my early recordings, it's that my foot goes across between cover and mid off before the pitching of the ball. I find it very difficult to play straight drives. In fact, I can't play the straight drive perfectly. Whenever I play the shot, the ball goes to mid off. My body and my head collapse on the right side whenever I go for this shot. I also find it very difficult to defend the ball on the stumps because of my foot. My foot goes across first. I feel it's very difficult to play stump line deliveries. Please help me with this because in a couple of weeks my under-19 trials are starting and I'm not feeling very confident about this. Please give me the proper solution and the drills that will help me improve this fault. Yeah, good one. Uh, Suman, uh, thank you for the imagery as well because that's made uh, made it even clearer what I, I think that you can go away and work on. I mean, effectively, um, you're attacking an off stump ball here by going across uh, the line of your stumps with your movement, and that often happens for people who uh, have got a stance position or a ready position, uh, which is too much towards leg stump or even outside leg stump with their alignment. So this, to me, is an alignment issue. So it can come in your guard because you're standing too far over to to leg side, which means that the only way you can fall onto the line of your off stump ball is to actually go across the line of your stumps with your movement rather than coming straight back towards your target. Uh, which is the right arm over bowler with your movement, um, or it can 
can be that uh, after you, you might be on middle, but your back foot can slip and go back towards leg stump or even outside leg stump, which then misaligns you to the incoming ball. And ultimately, that's always going to mean that your head and your centre of gravity is going to be outside the line of your base of support, which is why you're falling over and which is why you're playing a, a, a ball to, that's hitting off stump to cover rather than hitting that straight back down the ground. So um, ultimately, the first thing I'd look at would be your... Um, stance in terms of your guard alignment and where you are in relation to your stumps and how you're aligned to the target that would be my first point of call and obviously we can't see that from the two images that you've got because you've gone to movement and point of impact on your your two images so that would be my starting point um, and if you're in a good position on middle stump then I, I know that you would be moving that back foot and misaligning yourself to the oncoming ball um, so we'd do some real basic underarms or even rolled balls along the ground to get you to fall onto the line of the incoming ball keeping that back foot in a stable position so you're going to move forward with that back foot not moving and you can go straight to the line of the ball and go straight to it as opposed to across the line of the crease when you're you're moving across so I'd start it up like that and obviously as you become more competent with that I'd start to go maybe into uh, throw downs uh, start to go into sidearm and then get you up to bowlers over a, a period of time but you've got an alignment issue here and as a result of that you have to go across the line of the crease to get to a straight ball as opposed to coming back towards the target Levers, I've I've seen this before, and I'm, I've well, quite a bit actually, and I, I've also seen it where um, there's guys who are who do this, and they're perfectly happy with doing it. They know that it's a limitation of their game, but they also know that well, you know, I can I can hit the ball well enough on the offside, and you know, it might mean I have to play a bit squarer on the leg side, and I can't hit the ball through mid on very well, but that's just a limitation of my game, and I'm just going to get on with it and score lots of runs. Thanks very much. So. Is there a case sometimes before you pile in with something that you might think to yourself, actually, I can deal with this and I don't need to worry about it too much? Uh, well, yeah, there, there, there would be. Um, I think any time you're looking to change something, you need to weigh up what's the, what's the difficulty, what's the impact going to be of making this change, how long is it going to take me, how, how time constraining is it going to be. Um, and then weigh up against what's the uh, the positive impact it's going to have. So it's going to make whatever difference. It's going to open up this shot on this shot. It's going to potentially increase my scoring rate. It's going to potentially reduce my dismissal rate. And it's also going to do all of these positive and negative things for what period of time. Um, which is where you can understand that a guy who's maybe in his mid, late 30s, whatever it might be, he's not planning on playing for another 10, 15 years has learned to cope with a particular method um, and with potential flaws in his technique, but he's learned to cope with them and he's learned to make them work. Um, and he's probably got areas where he's, he's unable to score quite as effectively. Um, however, he's, he's able to keep the ball out in those areas and he's able to score more freely in others. Um, and because of that, it might be a case of, look, we, we just go on it. It sounds like in this case that 18, 19 years old, um, which is uh, I think how old he is. That if and, it, and also has an element of de desire really to to try and open up these new shots and try and reduce the the risks that are coming by getting pinned across uh, off stump and, and finding himself in front of the stumps. That the the desire is there to make the change and to to um, to to improve and open up new options. I guess. The only the slightly kind of not concerning thing because you're making a positive impact, positive move here by trying to improve something. But you've got trials in a couple of weeks. It's not it's not going to be that easy to make this feel really comfortable and natural for you necessarily in a couple of weeks. But um, look, it's better off approaching this now than it is in a week's time or in ten days' time or doing it on the day of the of the trial. So. Um, Gareth has talked a lot about the the kind of technical side of it, and I, I think. It's not something that is enormously uncommon. It's something that people struggle with balance issues or people struggle with alignment issues. You might find very easily that you set yourself up in a slightly different position, so a bit more on middle stump, or you focus on getting your head a little bit more above your base at the point of release, and suddenly everything clicks. And it might just be a case of readjusting that starting position, and within five minutes, everything seems 
everything seems different and you can very quickly learn those new shots that you're going to have. You're going to introduce a straight drive and an on-drive. You're going to introduce um, an ability to work the ball off your pads with a little bit more, probably more power and also a bit more control. Um, and also you're probably going to see the ball a little bit better just because you're going to be a bit more balanced when you're at the crease. So lots of positive things to come from it. In your In your case... Definitely try and commit to improving all areas as much as you can because you've got loads of time and obviously a lot of enthusiasm for the game. Um, just manage these next 10, 12 days through to your trials as best you can because it, it could be quite tricky making a change at this stage. But give it the best you can and, and get as many, uh, as many practice sessions in and make sure they're all driven towards making this improvement that you've been talking about. I guess if it is a concern to the player, then it is a concern, and it's something that needs to be, you know, examined in in more detail. Um, and if time is of the essence, then, you, like you said, Lavers, do do what you can and 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 move on with it, and maybe make it a longer term project than worrying worrying about this particular trial. Because if you're any good player, and it sounds like you are a good player, so man, then um, you've obviously got a way of getting through it as best you can at the moment. And even if your longer term aim is to make a, a positive change, then you can have a bit more confidence going into those trials thinking, OK, well, I've got a method here. It's not ideal, but it's still the one that I can score runs with. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to long term, I'm going to try and improve things further. Next question is from Samarth. And Samarth has a short has a shorter question, but it, it's, a, it's about a similar topic. But I found it quite... Quite an interesting question, so uh, let's see if we can discuss around the topic. Someone says, can you explain the flow of the cover drive with both the top hand and the bottom hand? Great word, that flow. Yeah, and you sort of start the pitch and maybe what's in his head when he talks about uh, that flow. And and one of the most flowing cover drives, I suppose, that... um, uh, I've chucked at would be Michael Vaughan's from a few years ago now um, and he had a fantastic flow through his extra cover drive in, in particular um, and, and his flow would have been that the top hand needs to stay on the line of a ball for as long as possible um, so he had a fantastic elbow front elbow and hand that would work uh, almost like a sort of pendulum swinging and going through the line of a ball uh, which is fantastic because that keeps the back face on the ball for longer um, and he was able to uh, hit a number of balls from slightly different lengths through that extra cover region as a result and, and the, the bottom hand really was there to to add a bit of punch into the shot, a bit of power into the shot um, because the top hand was steering the bat uh, through the ball. And then obviously we've got a, a player in... Uh, Virat Kohli by his own admission would call himself more of a bottom handed player yet it's still got a fantastic um, cover drive uh, on him uh, and we'd certainly say that in the last month or two uh, we've seen a lot of that on the, on our television screens in the UK and for those listening in, um, in India you've seen a lot of it over a long period of time but his bottom hand almost steers the ball as well so it, it's like his direction so it's almost a reverse from Vaughan his top hand does go through the ball but his bottom hand actually steers the ball um, uh, into into those gaps without flicking across it or, or uh, flicking into out he manages to drive the ball with his bottom hand being his steering thing so you know you've got different ways of doing it but the bottom line is that you want your hands to go through the line of a ball and keep the bat face on it for as long as possible um, Michael Vaughan did it with his top hand being the steerer Virat Kohli does it slightly with his bottom hand being the steerer but the two hands are working together a lot of the time when I see batters having very simple drills of slowing the ball down and having bobble feed if you stand behind and you put a video camera behind or you use your eyes from behind you will often see that the hands are almost having a battle against each other to stay on line with the incoming ball and then in the direction of the shot that you're looking to go so the, the bottom hand might be working towards mid on and the top hand's trying to work towards uh, extra cover uh, and the best players whether you go like a Virat Kohli or a Michael Vaughan manage to keep their hands going through the same line of a ball for as long as possible well, one of the one of the um, one of the one of the kind of drills that's really good for for doing that um, and getting those hands going through the line of the ball and um, ensuring that the ball is uh, sorry impact is made at the right time is 
is um, is that stunt drill that Amy de Villiers has used a lot, and he talks about quite quite a bit when he talks about his game. And I know he's done it on Sky Sports. He's done his little presentation, but that really simple drill, whether it's with a thin bat or with a cricket stump, is a really good way to practice driving a ball to ensure that your hands are in the right position because. In terms of timing, if you leave the line of the ball a fraction early or a fraction late, then you'll find very quickly that you're um, you're losing the you're leaving the middle of that stump or that thin bat or whatever it is you're using. So um, to follow that with a bit of a drill, I think the A B de Villiers drill that he does there, and I know lots of other guys have have done the same thing. Um, that's a really good way to make sure that your hands and the position and the um, direction that they're travelling is 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 absolutely spot on, and obviously. Being just a stump in your hand, any any mistakes in terms of alignment or pull or timing are magnified very very quickly. Um, and for those guys who do find themselves getting a little bit early on a ball, particularly, and that could often be those bottom-handed players. Um, and you see those guys who've come through from maybe a, a hockey or tennis background, and you think of De Villiers and Butler there as as two very obvious ones. Um, that kind of drill is a really good way to let the ball travel a little bit further, let that bottom hand take over at the right time and, and, and hopefully get that point of contact in a really good position that's going to allow you to accelerate through the ball, get it going in the direction you want it with a lot of power as well. It's a great drill, that uh, batting with a stump one that we, we've seen with A.B. De Villiers. And he doesn't do a huge amount of it. He sort of hits for like 12, 15 balls and then moves into into other drills. But it's like his checker, isn't it, Sam? It's like if I'm able to get my hands going through the ball with a stump, then obviously I'm ready to, to move on. So it's like a little technical check for him at the start of any session. I like to think that there's the occasional day where he hits 200 of them and he's just not getting it right <laughs> but I, I think it's very I reckon it will be a case of because we do we have a number of boys who are similar and a couple of girls actually who are similar in um, their battle is is waiting for the ball their battle is not overdoing it with that bottom hand and, and letting the ball come to them and, and that drill works really well for them um, but I remember each time I've shown them that video of A.B. de Villiers doing it with, I think it was NASA doing some throwdowns with a cricket ball on a grass pitch, and A.B. just crunching the middle out of every single one of them. And um, it usually, it will often take five or six balls before anyone makes any contact initially. And it's, um, it's, it's not easy. And look, these are the best guys in the world, and you see them doing drills, and they make things look very, very easy. But um, they're very, very difficult. But also, if you can work on them, they will make a really good impact on how you in this case wait for a ball and get your hands traveling through the right direction of the ball and sort of building on that one of the things that he really works on and you mentioned contact point uh, earlier in the answer is playing within his box and, and I've, I've heard him I've been next to a net where he was doing a similar thing for um, South African television on the way that he goes about it and he he talks about really playing within his box so he's got this little sort of imaginary box that sits around his body and if he uh, is playing well when he plays the, the ball so he's making contact with the ball and his hands and the bat are within that box and when he's not playing so well then he's probably reaching for the ball and uh, and, and his hands are burst in that box at point of contact so uh, again that stump drill is fantastic for getting your hands to go through in a straight line but also for making you uh, play straight because obviously by playing with such a, a thin implement if you uh, are reaching for the ball or you're off balance or your hands are going in opposite directions when they're playing a, uh, a shot then you, you're going to be compromised with batting with such a, a thin implement. And that is just about all we've got time for on the show today. We are just going to do one more thing before we leave, and that is decide on the winner of this week's competition, the online coaching course from Pitch Vision Academy at pitchvision.com. And the two questions were Suman's detailed question about his front foot and Samarth's question about the flow of the cover drive. Which one did you prefer this week, Garris? I'm going to go with Suman's really, just because of the sheer detail of it that he went into. Our, our answer around a fairly simple question from Samarth was actually, you know, not to blow too much uh, smoke up ourselves, but was pretty good. Um, but uh, I think the original question from Suman, I, I'm hoping he can go away uh, armed with a couple of uh, different ideas and, and go into that under-19 trial with a bit of confidence. 
great. Fantastic. Well done, Sir Man. Uh, hopefully you'll do well in that trial. Now, guys, if someone else was listening to the show and wanted their question read out and also get their chance to win that prize, how could they get in touch with us? They can give us a call on 0203 239 7543 or drop us an email on coach at pitchvision.com. That's correct. You can also get us through social media. Um, you can contact through the Pitch Vision system, of course, but you can also find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash pitchvisionacademy, and also on Twitter at pitchvisionacad. If you want to listen to the show every week, you can do that pretty easily by doing a search for Pitch Vision Academy in your favourite podcasting app. And um, just tap on subscribe there. It's free. It comes out every Friday. And uh, if you want to get the show notes or you want to listen to old shows, stream the show from the web or download the show to, to do it in the old-fashioned way of downloading the file from somewhere, then you can do all that, all of that on the Pitch Vision website, pitchvision.com slash academy. Click on the podcast link for all the details there. That's all for this week. We hope you listen next week. But until then, have a good week. Cheers, Garris. Cheers, Lavers. Cheers, fellas. Cheers, guys. Thank you.